Sharpening. I am your host, Josh Peck. There is a phenomena that has been plaguing a small percentage of humanity since ages past. No one has known the cause, and no one has had much success in being able to stop it until perhaps now. This is something I can personally identify with because it's a condition I suffered from ever since before I can remember. And it really wasn't until uh, maybe a little over a year ago that I was able to get a handle on it and finally make it stop. This phenomenon is known as sleep paralysis, which will be the topic of tonight's show. Our guest has recently wrote a book on sleep paralysis that not only gives vital information about the condition, but claims to provide ways to make it stop forever. Chris White has helped thousands of people stop sleep paralysis through his nonprofit websites and videos and has conducted one of the largest surveys ever done on the subject. Chris is a filmmaker and host of several online radio programs on various subjects. He is also the director of the internet radio station called the Revelations Radio Network. He is the author of several books, including Mystery Babylon, Should Christians Keep the Sabbath, The Pre-Wrath Rapture, and, most recently, Sleep Paralysis, What It Is and How to Stop It. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome Chris White to the show. Chris, how are you doing? Hey, Josh, I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It seems like you're doing great work here, and I'm happy to be a part of it. I appreciate you taking the time to do this, and uh, yeah, you're you're somebody I've been wanting to get on the show for a while, (laughs) and uh, I'm glad that we were finally able to uh, work our schedules to, uh, yeah, be able to be able to do this. Yeah, me too. Awesome. Uh, So for those who may not be familiar with you or your ministry, could you uh, give us your testimony, how you came to know Jesus, and how that led to what you do today? Sure. Well, um, I, I kind of... I guess it starts with um, me growing up. I kind of had a, a sort of nominal Christian family. They, you know, kind of Christian in name, I suppose. Um, but we really didn't didn't think much about it or anything. As I went into high school and everything, I got into uh, drugs and alcohol and the rest of it. I ended up being a part of a um, a band that toured uh, quite a lot for about ten years. And that was just a lot of uh, debauchery and everything that you would expect with a band. Uh, Somewhere about three years before I left the band, I actually got saved. And um, before that, I I sort of started getting into a lot of the the New Age stuff and um, a lot of the conspiracy stuff that led to New Age stuff, really. And uh, it was just a really dark time. I originally just sort of intellectually started finding out a lot of the stuff that the new age was saying was wrong. But I suppose even more than that, I was finding that a lot of it was the stuff that was wrong was stuff that was uh, intentionally intended to kind of discredit the Bible or discredit Jesus. So I started realizing a lot of that stuff was untrue. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I kind of intellectually came to the point of believing Christianity was true before I actually was saved. Um, Somewhere along the line there, I actually just made the commitment to start following Jesus and to say that, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna follow Jesus. And I think right around then, my life and heart started to change and started to um, have uh, a lot of the things that, that happened to new Christians. They, they just start having different desires and things. I started wanting to resist temptation more and just began growing in, in the Lord and reading the Bible and, and studying as I did that, I became uh, aware of um, a lot of the desire to want to go back in and talk to a lot of people about the things that I once believed, those intellectual problems with the New Age and so on and so forth. So I started making a lot of videos to that effect, debunking a lot of the false teachers that once had me convinced. Uh, that grew into a ministry, and uh, I basically have been doing it ever since, just kind of following wherever the need is. I have a lot of different uh, um, desires about that, so I'm kind of all over the board in terms of those things that I uh, uh, deal with. Uh, but uh, recently, it's been mostly focused on, as you mentioned, sleep paralysis. I just got done with this book, which is something that I wanted to do for a long time. Uh, the reason I, I wanted to do that was, uh, originally, I I think that it started with the research and people with people like Joe Jordan and uh, hearing what he had to say about people that were experiencing alien abductions and how the alien abductions could be stopped uh, using the name and authority of Jesus Christ. And uh, along the way there, I started to see the connection with 
quote unquote alien abductions and and sleep paralysis, which were striking. I started talking about that on early podcasts that I was doing, which led to a, a huge amount of emails from people that were also experiencing sleep paralysis. Over the years, I just um, through so many people writing and, and dealing with them on an individual basis, um, I became, became became very familiar with sleep paralysis and a lot of the different aspects of it. Uh, so much so that I eventually started a website, Stop Sleep Paralysis, and through that, we got even more um, uh, uh, feedback. So we were able to help even more people and hear more stories about sleep paralysis. Um, eventually uh, brought on people like Mike Tater, uh, a.k.a. Tom Bionic, and he ran the ministry for a long time. And then he got kind of busy and wasn't able to do a lot of that stuff, so I kind of took it back over. Uh, to, to, uh, we also conducted, as you mentioned, one of the largest uh, surveys on sleep paralysis through the website sleepsurvey.org. And to make a long story short, we've seen a lot of people stop sleep paralysis for good, which is significant because they say that it cannot be stopped for good, that there is no cure for sleep paralysis. So um, I suppose that brings us up to where we are right now, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Wow, that's awesome! Yeah, um, yeah, like I've said, uh, you know, I I used to suffer from this like extensively since since before I can remember, um, and you know, I've I've talked about this topic a little bit on the show and a, a little bit on other interviews I've I've done on other shows, but I I haven't really gone to you know, really in depth with it. So that's why I'm so excited to do a show like this. And, you know, I know for something like this, it can be a bit difficult to define because there's a definition the world has and a different definition that Christians have. But uh, to those who might not be familiar with the phenomenon, what what exactly is sleep paralysis? Well, sleep paralysis, and I'll give you the definition that I think both parties would agree with. Um, sleep paralysis is... Uh, a state where a person wakes up, typically they're paralyzed. They're not always paralyzed. Um, but it's it's one of the common things that happens, probably even more common than paralysis, is uh, what scientists call sensed presence, or sometimes they call it felt presence. And what they mean by that is that a person senses a almost always ma malevolent or evil presence in the room. And sometimes people uh, see it, sometimes they don't. They just feel that there's something there. Sleep paralysis, uh, if, it, if it's uh, of a more severe variety, sometimes things are seen. The, the presence, for example, is seen in a variety of forms. Uh, felt, this, uh, this presence can attack. Even uh, rape of both male and female happens. Uh, and a whole lot of things, sounds and a lot of different things, including out-of-body experiences. So it's in all of those things are, are things that science would agree with what people are experiencing. Uh, the the differences between what Christians would say and what science would say would would be the causes of sleep paralysis and why it's happening. They both would agree on the the facts of what happens during sleep paralysis. Um, but that pretty much sums it up. Oh, very good. Yeah, that. Yeah, I'd say that uh, that that defines what uh, some of the things I've been through and uh, others that that I've known who have who have gone through this as well. And um, I remember the one time <laughs> that I decided to talk to a doctor about it, which which was a bad idea because you know when you're when you're hearing voices and stuff like that, and you know you're not schizophrenic or something, and uh, <laughs> you talk to a doctor about it, you get you get some interesting answers. But um, the the way that uh, it was explained to me was, you know, of course it's a medical doctor, so it was just explained in medical terms that it was uh, basic, uh, basically like a misfiring of some of the chemicals in your brain that go off when you sleep and and stuff like that, and that the 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 um, the experiences I had were just hallucinations. And uh, now I didn't tell the doctor this, but I've had experiences where they've left evidence behind, like in the the, the next day, like the door would still be open or something would be moved that I, I saw moved the night before I had that. So um, that was uh, that was when I stopped looking for <laughs> for a medical uh, answer to the problem. And actually, it's funny that you uh, you brought up the new age stuff in your testimony, because at, at that time, you know, this was a long time ago, um, I turned to new age theology to try to find an answer, which, of course, just made it 
far worse. <laughs> right. But uh, um, so th- this whole this whole sleep paralysis thing, it, it's this isn't anything new. It's actually something that goes way back in re- recorded history. Uh, can you give us some of the history of sleep paralysis? I will. I will definitely do that. Um, but if you want to, I can kind of uh, unpack a little bit more what science is saying. You mentioned a few things about, uh, you know, chemicals in the brain misfiring and so on. And perhaps yeah, it would be uh, good for me to kind of lay out what they're saying and, and maybe why they're wrong. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Well, they basically say that sleep paralysis is uh, when the w- the body waking up uh, before the, the, the mind does, I guess you could put it, one way. Um, essentially, there is there are chemicals and so on that keep your body from uh, moving about while you're asleep and acting out your dreams. Um, so your body is, if you will, naturally paralyzed. I guess you could say um, when you're when you're sleeping. And what they'll say is that the body is waking up, but essentially the mind uh, or the body is still asleep or in, still paralyzed while the mind wakes up. And that may or may not be true. There may be significance to that in terms of the paralysis. But that's really not the question. The question is, why are people seeing, hearing, feeling, being attacked by a presence during this uh, this state? And, you know, it, it, doctors and so on, and I've read as many uh, experts on this as possible, especially in the medical journals and so on. And to make a long story short, they really have no idea why why it happens they they will admit that they have no idea the the physiology of of these hallucinations and why it happens is completely unknown they do have uh certain theories it's really kind of frustrating to hear you know uh when doing this research and so on and talking to people about it that will say you know science knows that this is caused by you know x y or z and in reality they really admit that they don't know um in regard to the hallucinations what they say is happening is they say that a, a person's um, a, a amygdala is malfunctioning. Uh, malfunctioning. It's interesting what they'll, if you read the papers, they say that the hallucinations are caused by the felt presence. I know that sounds kind of mm-hmm. counterintuitive. You're feeling an evil presence in the room, and they're saying, well, that feeling of an evil presence is causing hallucinations. Um, there's, there, there's a great study. I mean, that's, that's the main, the view, a guy named, uh, Cheyenne, uh, is like the main sleep paralysis, uh, guy in the medical community. And his theory is prevalent, prevalent right now. And that is essentially what he says that, that, that the hallucinations are caused by the felt presence, which leaves the oh, big wow. question in the room. Uh, well, what's causing the felt presence, you know, <laughs> yeah, no why, kidding. why is there a presence there in the first place? Because he's basically saying that the felt present, you, you feel this evil presence, and so your mind like makes up all this uh, uh, audio and visual hallucinations to sort of accompany that feeling. But the question is, why in the world are you feeling a presence in the first place? And to that, um, they essentially say that uh, uh, the body is is waking up, and it's causing the what they call the threat activated vigilance system to misfire. The threat-activated vigilance system is something that everybody has, and it's intended to uh, to sort of make you uh, hyper-vigilant in order to assess a threat. So, for example, if you're in the woods and you heard uh, a noise rustling in the ro- in the woods, you would your threat-activated vigilance system would sort of uh, take effect, and you would you would look around. Is that a bear? You know, you have to assess if it's a bear or not in order to determine the, the proper reaction. So what they say is that your threat-activated vigilance system is is misfiring when you wake up and are paralyzed, and then because there is no threat, you are creating a threat, and that is where the uh, the sensed presence comes in. So the reason that they say that, and I think the best way to show um, to show how wrong that theory is, is to show how they came to this conclusion. They did so by doing uh, cer- certain neural neuroimaging techniques such as uh, MRIs and a few other different things where they were able to determine that when a person was having sleep paralysis, their amygdala was active. The amygdala is basically, it does a lot of things, but it's uh, it's primarily the, the fear center of the brain. If you're ex- extremely afraid, your amygdala will uh, be active. 
And so they, they were able to simply tell that a person's amygdala was active during sleep paralysis. And so they hypothesized that the amygdala was malfunctioning and thereby and as a result of this threat activated vigilance system or, or vice versa. So in other words, but, but let me try to unpack why this doesn't make any sense. Um, they have no way of knowing what comes first, the felt presence or the amygdala, uh, the amygdala reactions, because of course a, a felt evil presence in the room, and you you being unable to move is of course a very fearful thing. So your amygdala right. would be active because a person is fearful, and that that is so crucial to this theory because their entire theory is based on which comes first, and they admit they have no way of knowing which comes first. I was reading. Uh, uh, again, one of the top guys in this field about this problem, and he basically says that it doesn't seem likely that they're ever going to be able to tell because the person is asleep and you know incapacitated, and there's no way for them to signal even if you know because it would even if they could signal because it's it's something that would be milliseconds apart. You know what came first, the the uh, awakening or or the or the 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 feeling of a sensed presence or the fear. So they right. don't. The, the, the most crucial aspect of their theory, which comes first, the fear or the, the evil presence, uh, is unable to be determined. And I would further state that this entire theory is is made completely uh, moot by the instances of people having sleep paralysis that are awakened by the hallucination. So, for example, if you were if you heard a voice that woke you up, or, for example, I had a case one time, I've had sleep paralysis about three times, and I was actually awoken uh, by a slap in my face. Now, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> so if I was awoken by a quote-unquote hallucination, I didn't have time to awake first, then my threat vigilant system activate, and then my amygdala hallucinate, and the rest of it. I, I actually had the quote-unquote hallucination first, so it completely throws the entire theory out of the water. And there, it goes on like this with the way that they view the out-of-body experiences during sleep paralysis. There are so many exceptions to their rules that it, it seems obvious that at the very least they need to retool the whole the whole theory. So I, I personally believe that their their admission to not knowing the cause is significant in the, in the minds of the sleep scientists who are experts in sleep paralysis. They really do know that they are in trouble, but when you know, when you look in the popular level, when when people what people believe about the science of sleep paralysis, you find everybody thinks that everybody knows what it is, but um, but it's just not true. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember when I uh, I was probably about sixteen or seventeen, and I was really trying to find some answers to this, and I I you know looked uh, from what I could find on the internet, which which wasn't much, and and this was a little while ago, but I remember the one thing that I did find. Well, any anything that I found was either it was on one, either side of two extremes. It was either uh, extremely medical and there's no spiritual, you know, funny business going on, or it was like way new agey and and like e stuff that even back then made me uncomfortable. But uh, I remember one of the medical sites that I looked at. There, there was uh, it was one of the only ones I found at that time where you could actually share your own experience. But what I thought was what I thought was funny is it said on the on the forum header that um, if you if you say anything in in your shared experience if you if you say anything about uh, anything spiritual or that you believe it it would it, that it could be demons your post will be removed I thought that was so interesting that it's like you know, how I, many times I know what you're talking about <laughs> I, I remember that forum uh, I remember that very clearly that's interesting I, I haven't seen it in a while it must be not there anymore but probably not this was a while ago when i saw it but yeah it, it made me think like okay they must have got a lot of people saying that they believed it was demons to have a post like that especially you know especially to s single out that one uh that one conclusion if you say that it's demons you know you, your post will be removed and i, I thought that was uh I, I thought that was pretty interesting. So ha has anybody in like in, in the medical, I know there's a lot of sleep studies and stuff. Has anybody uh, tried to do a sleep study on paralysis or, or sleep paralysis or come up with anything from that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there, there's been uh, uh, a huge amount of studies on sleep paralysis. Um, 
from, I mean, trying to figure out all kinds of aspects of sleep paralysis, everything from studies just devoted to out-of-body experiences and, and, and everything related to sleep paralysis. So, so there have been surveys and all kinds of stuff that are done to uh, – so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of material out there about sleep paralysis from the, from a medical point of view. They're not just uh, saying that they don't know because they haven't tried to figure it out. They are they <laughs> right. are they've tried really really hard and they're still still haven't come to the conclusion. What's frustrating about a lot of the medical journals is that you won't you won't know for sure if their hypothesis failed unless you read the article because the way that they uh, title them and their abstracts and conclusions, which are posted for everybody to see. Uh, you oftentimes have to buy the paper or be a part of a university or whatnot in order to read the paper. But if you read the paper, you would find out it really did. It didn't work. Their hypothesis was inconclusive or or wrong. But um, so so I feel like in the case of uh, a lot of the sleep studies, they're being somewhat disingenuous. At least at least some of them, but certainly not all of them. Wow. Yeah, so with all with all the research that they've done into this topic, that that really does only leave the uh, the it, it it just seems like with with everything that we have at our disposal, especially in the medical uh, medical industry, that if there was if it was just a strictly medical problem, and I'm sure there is some you know there is there is something to that, but I don't think it's totally, I don't think that's all it is. Uh, if if it was just a strictly medical problem, they should have been able to come up with a strictly medical solution and uh, it doesn't sound like that they've been able to do that i remember uh and th this was a while ago but the one time that i went and saw that doctor about it he he even he even said well you know there isn't anything i could prescribe you for this because if i give you any kind of sleep aid it'll just make it worse and you know you can't stay up forever so <laughs> that was kind of his advice right. but this well th this was a long time ago that's a good point <laughs> you know a lot of people when they go to a doctor well, let me first uh talk about the um uh, the spiritual solution to the problem. The feedback here, Josh, uh, I guess. Okay, there it goes. Um, okay. So, yeah, in terms of what I would say to the idea is that uh, I would say to the medical community, you have a lot of people, and they would admit this, that are saying that there's a spiritual solution to the problem. That is that, you know, if you if you apply the methods, for example, you know, that I and others talk about, um then it stops. Now, that is significant, and that shouldn't be overlooked, and they certainly shouldn't go on saying that there's no cure, because right. there apparently is a cure, and there's a lot of uh, testimonies for, of people and, and that, have, that can prove that. But the point is, at the very least, the medical community needs to find out why, from their anti-supernatural perspective, why it is that all these people who are claiming to stop uh, sleep paralysis with the name and authority of Christ are, in fact, stopping it because it, there should be, in their view, some medical reason why that's happening. You know, maybe maybe it's causing a different part of their brain, blah, 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 you know, some kind of medical you know, reason why uh, these people are curing <laughs> sleep paralysis. But they shouldn't go on saying that there's no cure. In regard to the the prescription of drugs, it, your doctor is is wise not to have uh, prescribed you anything, but it's certainly not the case that happens with a lot of people. They are getting prescribed particularly um, uh, antidepressants of all sorts and a number of other cocktails of drugs, which is odd because there are studies that show that um, drugs, particularly uh, anxiolytics and SR SRIs and other different drugs, are actually causing uh, people are five times more likely to get sleep paralysis or worsen sleep paralysis with those drugs. So, right. so they're actually giving them a drug saying that it's going to help with sleep paralysis, which is known to cause sleep paralysis. So it's, it's kind of a backwards <laughs> thing going on in the medical community. Absolutely. I, um, you know, I, I, I have a, a rare degenerative bone disease called Trevor's disease and uh, I was prescribed uh, and a a actually I, I <laughs> am supposed to still be on them but I, qu I quit taking them and uh, I, I was prescribed some pretty heavy duty painkillers and that uh, I always had to be careful how I took them because the, the narcotics if I took them past a certain time like around 6 p.m. I would get sleep paralysis that night every night <laughs> and uh, I, I remember 
as long as I as long as I took them early enough in the day, there wasn't too much of a problem. But it would still I, I mean, it was still almost a daily thing, whereas before I was uh, before I was prescribed narcotics, it would be maybe two or three times a month. Um, and I, I remember by, by that time, I was a little bit older. This was after I talked to the, the first doctor. I had a different doctor and I, I just I didn't want to get into the whole sleep paralysis thing with him. So I just told him I was having bad dreams and uh, he, he didn't really have any any kind of solution for that either, except, you know, more, uh, prescriptions, which I didn't really want at the time. But, um, yeah, since I've, uh, since I've stopped taking painkillers and that, that, that's not something that I would like go out and recommend for people who are on narcotics to just stop taking them. It was something for me that I knew I needed to do because I was also addicted to them. And, um, that, that was something that, you know, between me and God was, was something that I had to do. So, uh, w once I stopped doing that, uh, the sleep paralysis, it, I, I haven't had an issue with it since. And I, I, for me, I mean, I'm just kind of speculating, but, uh, for at least my case, I think at least a, a large part of it for that time was, uh, you know, the, the chemicals and the narcotics, but also my addiction to them. And when I was able to finally, you know, stop doing what I knew was wrong, because I wasn't just taking them for pain, I was abusing them too. Um, then that it kind of uh, it it kind of tapered off after that. Um, sure. so, well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, about drugs and about a few of the other causes of sleep paralysis, because yeah, absolutely, um, because I think that. Well, drugs has been a, a cause, if you will, uh, of uh, spiritual problems really from the beginning. Um, in, in your case, it sounds like it probably worsened uh, sleep paralysis more than was the initial cause of it. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. But, Absolutely. But, the, you know, from the very beginning, drugs were a way for shamans and so on to actually contact the spirit world. I mean, there is almost no ancient culture that didn't have a shaman that did that uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know taking some kind of uh, drug and uh, and then you know contacting the spirit world for all kinds of information or you know some kinds of uh, just all kinds of varied stuff. So it, the drug thing has been around for a long time. Um, one of the other causes will I'm you know probably get into this a little bit more, but uh, is occult practices and things like that, but also uh, generational issues or, or something that can open up doors to a large degree. And I think I should probably kind of backtrack a little bit here before I get into all that stuff and maybe talk a little bit about what I mean by open doors and, and how that all works, uh, from sure. at least from what I understand. See, it, it, it basically is um, that we all kind of have a, a natural spiritual protection from from any kind of uh, evil spirits. Well, I guess I should. I need to really back up again and talk about <laughs> why is it logical to even believe that this is a, a spiritual problem as opposed to right. anything else from the medical point of view. And I would, I would, to that I would say that uh, we know from the science of anthropology that mankind, from the very beginning, has been dealing with uh, these beings. Uh, we'll call them demons for our purposes. But the ancient cultures called them by a variety of names. But the one thing that's interesting th from an anthropological perspective is that they all had the same kinds of characteristics. They were, for example, summoned in the same kind of ways. They were described as deceptive and evil. Uh, they were very smart and knowledgeable. They had information to give and power to give they were able to sort of give the abilities the these kind of supernatural abilities if if a person was uh willing to allow them enough access to them and things like that the story of our human family from the beginning across the board is almost the exact same picture of these uh entities and what's interesting is that we've always known that the more you contact them, the worse it is for the person. And that person is uh, in, in extreme danger. You know, the shaman idea these days is kind of neo-shamanism has become very popular. Uh, and everybody wants to take drugs and, and, you know, have these experiences. But there was a reason in the old days why only one person in the tribe was a shaman. 
because right. it was dangerous and it was not a good thing. And he was on the outside of the camp and he was a person, you know, that was in danger because of his extreme contact with these spirits. The Bible warns us against those kinds of practices, uh, drugs and these kind of rituals and occult practices. And what it says is interesting. It says that those things will defile us. That word is really interesting in the Hebrew, but uh, the, ba- the basic idea is that, it, is that it's not good for us. God says don't do those things that contact spirits and so on because it will harm you. God didn't just arbitrarily come up with this rule about not doing divination and so on. He said don't do it because it will defile you. And that defiling is basically uh, giving the devil an opportunity. Um, it says don't. Uh, for example, don't let the sun go down in your anger, lest to give Satan a foothold. That word foothold in the Greek is topos, meaning, meaning essentially an opportunity for acting. And the basic idea of the opening doors is that we have a natural protection against demonic spirits, uh, where they can't really affect us, do much stuff to us, unless we begin to erode that natural protection. Now, we can do that eroding on our own through various activities that I mentioned already, uh, you know, occult practices, drugs, all kinds of different sin issues are involved there. Anything that's particularly obsessive and, you know, blasphemy, you know, extreme. A lot. There's a lot of things that can cause sleep paralysis. But there's also a, a huge amount of people with sleep paralysis that, uh, for example, like you were saying that, you know, you've had it as long as you can remember or since you were three or, uh, you know, a lot of people say these kinds of words that uh, that essentially means they've been having these kinds of experiences um, since they were children. And, of course, children aren't going to be doing, you know, occult practices or taking drugs or whatever. So what's the what's the deal there? And right. we had a uh, on the survey, we had a question where uh, if a person an- answered the question of, you know, how long have you been having sleep paralysis? And they answered that similar uh, in a similar way that that is to say, um, you know, ever since I can remember or since I was three or something like that. They almost always checked another box that said, have your parents or grandparents ever been, you know, uh, involved in the occult or some kind of high level fraternal organization or something like that? And the amount of people that were that uh, checked that they'd been having it since a young age it was extremely uh uh, significant the amount of people that also checked that their parents or grandparents were involved in some way in all this stuff and that doesn't mean that in every case uh you know we you know throughout the years i've talked to a lot of people um some of those that have said they've been having it since uh since before they can remember and you know you know talking with them in one-on-one and trying to figure out what it was you know was it your parents something your parents did something grandparents did i don't know uh we never could find uh, an issue. And so f- sometimes I'll just say, you know, it's, it's very rare that we can't ever get to the bottom of what it was. But we've kind of come to the conclusion that if we can't figure it out, it's no big deal. Something happens somewhere, uh, but it doesn't really <laughs> matter because it can be stopped and stopped for good. Um, it is interesting. Sometimes the generational stuff, and, and I need to be a little more clear on the generational issue because I, I don't uh, – what what's happening with the generational issue is difficult to say, but but I, I perceive what's happening is that um, a parent or grandparent essentially has authority over the child in a in a biblical kind of sense before the child has that own authority of his, his or her own to give away, and so essentially the parent or grandparent can be tricked, and this is. This is something that's important to realize. I mean, the parents or grandparents aren't doing any of this stuff knowingly. They love their children and their grandchildren. and They're not intentionally doing stuff. But they may be involved in in something that um, they have no idea the true nature of that thing. But they're being uh, uh, sort of manipulated into doing certain things that ultimately give that authority of their uh, that child under their uh, headship or protection away. And so doors are opened uh, in that with that child very early on. But I want to say about the generational stuff that it can sometimes be extremely severe. Some of uh, the most severe sleep paralysis stuff that I've seen is probably uh, tied with generational stuff and extreme occult stuff. And so there is it can be a pretty significant issue. And it's not it's not an easy thing to to, you know, um, to. It takes a little bit of work and 
things I describe in the book, you know, uh, prayer and, and, and closing the doors and stuff like that. And it can be a little harder with those that have severe generational issues or uh, a, a major, you know, an occult past. The way I sort of describe that sometimes is kind of like if a person was an alcoholic and they drank a bottle of vodka every day and that person got saved and the Lord totally, you know, took their desire for it away or what have you, you know, they, they became a Christian and everything and it wasn't a big problem for them anymore. That person still might have residual scar tissue on his or her liver. Um, I mean, it's the Lord's prerogative to heal that liver as well, but oftentimes the person still retains a lot of the scars that they had um, from from the previous life. And that is not to say that those scars won't go away completely. I think sometimes with the the stuff that I say, I think people get discouraged because, uh, you know, the sleep paralysis isn't gone immediately afterward. But uh, it takes a little bit more work for those people. And one of the ways that I describe it, and I'm sure we'll get into this more, is by using the authority that Christ has given us in a very particular way, uh, a way that the demons are not at all cool with, and being very consistent with that. And what that's being, being consistent with those things and the way that we describe is what we have found to be the way to even end those sporadic occasions of sleep paralysis for good. Um, but I'm sure we'll get into all that, and, and we can go on to the next uh, question. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I got to say, uh, at, at least in, in my case, and that's really the only point of reference I have for myself, but uh, that <laughs> that really rings true. Um, my uh, my mom was she, – she was saved and everything, but she went through – she kind of went through a period of, uh, I don't know, confusion, I guess. Uh, and it's kind of funny because, well, not like funny, but I, I went through something similar later, you know, later on in my life. But before I was born, my mom kind of uh, got into some occultish type things. And my dad wasn't saved at all um, at the time. I, I, I don't know if he is now. But uh, anyway, so before I was born, they you know, they were kind of doing stuff that they shouldn't have been doing. And there was a lot of uh, stuff going on in the house that shouldn't have been going on. And that, that was the type of environment I was born into. I, I can remember a, a couple of, a couple of weird things when I was a kid. Cause um, you know, my mom never came out and like told me any of the stuff that, that happened until I was much older, but I, I can still remember some of it. Cause I, the house that we lived in at the time um from my understanding of the situation, my my mom and uh, dad decided it would be uh, fun to uh, kind of mess around with a Ouija board one night. <laughs> and they uh, apparently opened something because my I remember my mom telling me um, that since that night, she felt that the house was haunted. And even though she was a Christian, she, she just didn't have the background to know like if haunting was real or ghosts or, or how to reconcile any of that, you know, with her Christian beliefs. And, um, you know, my, and the only, the main influence that she had at the time was my dad who wasn't a Christian. He, he kind of looked at that stuff as, you know, cool and exciting. So he would, uh, he would mess around with it more. That was the type of environment I was born into. So that, that the generational thing makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, I, I was raised as a, as a Christian too, the same as my mom. And then I, uh, when when I was a teenager, I, I started going through a period of confusion of, of my own where I was kind of getting into more occultish and new age things because I didn't know how to reconcile some of the stuff I was seeing and going through with the Bible. But um, and, you know, that's that's where drug abuse and when, uh, you know, I, I had this steady flow of narcotics at my disposal at, at my disposal whenever I wanted it. So that that kind of led into a bunch of areas of, of my life that I, I shouldn't have gotten into. But for for me, it wasn't until I really got a hold of that and, um, you know, I, I guess rededicated my life to Jesus where I, where I was like, OK, you know, I'm done with all this. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for you that the healing process started. And, and you're absolutely right for me. It wasn't something that it was just a one quick thing and it was done. It, it, it took, a it took about a year of, of really, you know, walking in Jesus and, 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 um, you know, using his authority and all that until it, until it finally stopped. But, um, but yeah, so that's that's really interesting what you say about the genera generational stuff because I can I can definitely uh, identify with that. 
Um, do you, uh, let's see, where are we at here? I kind of <laughs> went off on a little bit of a tangent, but <laughs> well, that, that's why I like doing shows like this because, uh, you know, you never know who's going to listen and, uh, part of, part of our testimonies can have a big impact. Um, do you, do you see like it, what, what would be like the earliest case in history? Like, do you see a point of origin anywhere in the past or it doesn't show up in the Bible sleep paralysis specifically, or is it just something that's kind of, uh, always been there? Well, um, uh... There is some debate uh, about whether it's in the Bible or not. There's an interesting seg- segment in Job uh, where one of Job's friends um, says he, you know, is talking about when, visions that come in the night when men are asleep, and and it, he sees this uh, this um, being floating above his bed that seems to be giving him some uh, somewhat wrong information. And some have suggested that's a case of sleep paralysis in, in the Bible. I'm afraid I don't have the uh, the uh, uh, the reference for you. I, if you probably Googled when sleep comes upon men in Job or something like that, it, it should come up. There's a few instances where that phrase shows up. But anyhow, um, whether it's in the Bible or not, I'm not sure. There is a lot of, um, uh, of course, the Bible is about the, the greatest source for demonology that we have, that is, you know, what humans are like, where they come from, how to deal with them. And in, in secular history, there is quite a lot of uh, understanding of sleep paralysis. It is a phenomenon known virtually in every major culture. And uh, to this day, a good place to go is if you just type in sleep paralysis and go to the Wikipedia and go down to, the, it's got this massive list of what other cultures have called sleep paralysis over uh, years and mostly those those phrases translate into something like demon, you know, attacking, ghost uh, attack, or you know, some kind of variation of that. Uh, uh, you know, ghost sitting on your chest, I think, is the, one of the Chinese or, or words of it. And so there's so it's certainly something that that humanity has experienced for a long, long time. There's been a lot of you know studies done in different cultures. Um, the old hag, for example, is something that was, uh, I think it's in the uh, uh, more uh, Netherlands kind of area. I'm, I'm probably blanking on that right now. But um, they often, when they experience sleep paralysis, it comes in the form of this old hag. Um, I, I tend to, you know, in our experience, is sleep paralysis and the, the however the, the bean shows itself is often tied to either cultural beliefs or personal beliefs. I feel like a lot of times the way that they perceive them, you know, uh, cause you know, as the Bible says, demons can appear as angels of light. Don't be surprised if his ministers also, uh, Satan can appear as an angel of light. Don't be surprised if his ministers also come as ministers of righteousness. At the very least, we know that they can appear as different things. And what I've seen is a lot of times they're doing something to intentionally deceive and if they're trying to deceive at all. Sometimes they're just trying to plain scare a person. But, for example, they will often appear as, you know, aliens or something to make the person think that something else is going on. Or dead relatives is a, is a common one. Or, uh, you know, something that, that happens sometimes is that they'll show up as some kind of, you know, hooded figure or some kind of weird Egyptian thing and they'll give some kind of name that you know some ridiculous name or something like that that the person then goes and looks up on the internet and lo and behold it's the name of some you know ancient god or something like that they're they're really smart demons are and sometimes they they try to uh make us go further in into our you know occult or new age beliefs by validating some kind of new age belief through what they appear as um, so you need to be on your guard when you're experiencing these kinds of things because they can uh, and often do lie, but in such a way that it seems interesting, I guess is another thing. Another common thing that they do and have done in the past is uh, somehow or another try to make the person feel special, feel uh, as, as though they are uh, you know, the one, the only, the only one that has it figured out or something like that to give a certain tinge of pride, uh, because that pride is so important in the new age, in the occult, the belief that, you know, you are, 
the 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 one the chosen one that has all the superpowers and so a lot of times people for example i knew a a guy who was dabbling into satanism and he was starting to you know wonder if the sleep paralysis stuff was not a good thing and so we were talking about it and one of the things that he had perceived sleep paralysis as uh, which was sort of encouraged by the encounters that we, he was having was that it was, um, you know, it, it was a result of him getting more powerful. You know, his, his psychic powers were getting so strong that now he was this close to the spiritual world. And this was just a, a sort of side effect of his power. And so that's the kind of thing that I think that you need to be on guard about with it. But, um, but yeah, to answer the question, this is certainly something that uh, is definitely a history all throughout history, mankind has experienced sleep paralysis. Now, in addition to sleep paralysis, uh, people, you know, spirit possession and things like that goes, you know, we also have a whole nother list of, of what people believe about that in ancient cultures and ancient history, certainly in the Bible and the rest of it. But in terms of just sleep paralysis, most of what we get from history is in terms of other cultures. Wow. So do you, do you think that the uh, the demonic entities um, that that show up do you think that they that they can cause the sleep paralysis or do you think they're taking advantage of of something that might be more medical in nature? I I feel like the paralysis. Uh, I, I'm not sure about this. First of all, I feel as though they're capitalizing on a weakened state. They may know that uh, if you can wake a person up at a certain point. Um, that they can be incapacitated for a minute, and that's why they attack then. This seems to be a general tactic of Satan anyway. When a person is at their weakest point is when he attacks. For example, um, Jesus in the wilderness when he was fasting and, and almost uh, starving to death after 40 days of fasting is when his temptation from Satan came, when he was at his absolute weakest. And I think that in a, in a spiritual sense, Satan always capitalizes on the weak, and and when when you're at your weakest point, he will attack. So I, I I think that it's possible that at least the paralysis aspect of it could be um, uh, could be just a, a purely medical phenomenon. Um, but uh, it could also be that their you know their presence also paralyzes a person. I don't have any evidence for for that. So uh, I tend to believe the latter that they're capitalizing on something. Yeah, that that, that makes a lot of sense. There. You know there are there are times in the Bible too where people uh, th this is generally with good angels but uh, like uh, when Daniel and his friends uh, you know and then the angel came and uh, they it, it said they, they fell flat on their faces for for fright and that that was a good angel so <laughs> um, I, I can imagine that uh, there there might be something to that too you know what what would the what would a demon or fallen angel be able to accomplish if they if they felt so inclined. Uh, so we went through. We you, you talked about some of the causes that uh, where where this can get started. Do, do you see any difference in cause between Christians or non Christians, or is it just pretty much the same all across the board? Um, well, I'll say this. I think that Christians can certainly get sleep paralysis. Um, when I the three the three occasions that I've had sleep paralysis, um, I was a Christian and you know doing nothing. Uh, nothing I could tell wrong in any of those cases. Um, they were very sporadic. You know, I, I haven't had one in, I don't know, three years or something like that. They were probably spaced out, you know, a year and a half, two years. And each time I couldn't quite come up with a, a reason for it. Uh, but that's, that's one thing. I think that there, that certainly Christians can get sleep paralysis, especially, uh, let's put it this way. When, as I mentioned before, when a, when a Christian becomes a Christian, those doorways that they've spent a long time opening don't immediately close. So certainly right. they can continue to get sleep paralysis after that. The, the, the core issue with that is this. Um, Jesus in, in uh, Luke 10, 19 through 20, gives Christians authority over uh, demons. So a Christian potentially has the ability to deal with this. But not every Christian does. Not every, every you mean... The authority does you no good unless you use it, especially in the case when a person right. is getting severe sleep paralysis and has a lot of open doors. Um, I, I, I make a big distinction about this in the book. If a person is having very uh, rare occurrences of sleep paralysis, you know, once uh, every, you know, twice a year or something like that, 
it's almost it's almost unavoidable. I mean, it, Satan's going to find some kind of some kind of way to do it. It is usually going to be a pretty light level thing. Um, I make a distinction that if between that and what I call regular sleep paralysis, if a person is getting extremely severe or extremely frequent sleep paralysis, Christian or non-Christian, then there's something wrong. There's something that needs to be done uh, to stop it. So, so in terms of the causes, they, they're all essentially the same. The, the way that we open doors uh, is the same across the board. But in terms of the solution, I think that Christians have the ability, but they don't often use it. I make a, a, a one of the things that I say in the book that we have uh, seen the most success with is, of course, in Luke ten nineteen, Jesus says, behold, and this is after he sends out the 70 and they come back and they're really excited because they have been able to cast out demons just like Jesus was able to. Do. And they're telling Jesus, hey, look what we were able to do. You know, we were able to cast out demons. And and he says, behold, I've given you authority of snakes and scorpions that nothing shall by any means harm you. But in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather that your name is written in heaven. And the way that now right. it is true that sometimes people get saved that have had sleep paralysis and the Lord just stops it all. I mean, I, I got lots and lots of testimonies of people that were having severe sleep paralysis. They get saved. They never really know much about using the authority of Christ or anything, but it just stops as soon as they're saved. So that's that's definitely a possibility. But for the more severe cases, uh, I think that we need to use the authority in the same way that it's used in the Bible. Um, Acts 16, 16 is a good example of the woman who was able to tell fortunes that was following Paul and I think Silas around and, uh, you know, mocking them. And he turns around and just, you know, says, in the name of Jesus, you know, come out of her or whatever. So there is a, a certain amount of uh, a spoken rebuke that needs to happen. A lot of people say, you know, um, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you or something like that. What we found and what I make a big case for in the book is that the act of sending demons to the abyss, in the name of Jesus, I command you to go to the abyss, never return, something simple like that, is extremely effective. And the way it's effective, not just in the first time you use it, of course, but but in the consistency of you using it. If you're the kind of person that says, look, every time that I get attacked, whether I am able to speak or not, I'm going to wake up as soon as I am able to speak, and I'm going to send these things to the abyss using the name and authority of Christ. And you're the kind of person that is just a guy who is going to do that. And that's what you do, rain or shine, every time. If you can do it during the event, you know, sometimes people pray to God to let, let uh, you be able to speak so that you can, uh, in fact, uh, send them to the abyss or rebuke them or whatever. What we found is that's really the key to ending the abyss the uh, uh, event for good. And the reason, I think, is because Satan has a limited amount of players on the field. He accomplishes a lot of what he is trying to do in the world through his uh, agents, through these demons. And he doesn't have an unlimited supply. And I go through in the book the scriptural basis for, number one, saying that the abyss is a place that is a prison for spirits until a particular time. And then they're going to be let out probably in Revelation, um, uh, uh, is it uh, 7? I'm not sure exactly right now. But the point is that uh, the, the demons, for example, and in, in, in the instance of the demoniac of um, in Mark 5 and the parallel passages, they cry out to Jesus and say, um, are you going to send us to the abyss before the appointed time? Please don't, is essentially what they're saying. And instead, he sends them into pigs and whatnot. But the point is, is that uh, they are extremely afraid of this. We've seen in other places in, this, in Scripture, and again, I make the case for us being able to do that. And so I'll, ultimately, what I'm trying to say is that Satan can't uh, risk sending a demon to a person who is almost certainly going to send them to the abyss because it's a, it's a player off the field for him. And eventually it's just not advantageous anymore for him to use the opportunity that he has uh, from the doors that are open to a person. Now, of course, a non-Christian can't do this. We know that, uh, number one, they don't have the authority that Christ has given them. And number two, it can be dangerous. With the seven sons of Sceva, et cetera, we see that, uh, you know, when, when people who saw this working in other instances tried it on, uh, on people that were suffering from demonic attack, 
they themselves were attacked. The demon says, you know, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? And he and the the person uh, with the demon attacked them. So now, of course, it's not just uh, the, the, the rebuking, but it is a, a continual dialogue with the Lord that uh, helps to close those doors completely as well. So, wow. uh, uh, yeah, I think that is the answer. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's, that's fascinating. Um, that, that's actually something that I never really uh, thought, thought about before. You know, I, I, I've, uh, you know, gotten in the habit of uh, when something happens or, you know, when there's a manifestation of some sort, uh, you know, you, you cast it out. But as far as uh, casting it to the abyss, that's that, that, that's profound. I, I, I think that's 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 awesome. <laughs> um, so so we, we talked about using Jesus authority to um, re, you know, rebuke these things when it happens, uh, whether if somebody can speak at the at the moment or not. You know, uh, you can say it in your mind, or you can just wait till you can speak. Uh, is there anything else that, um, along with doing that, is there anything else that could be used as maybe preventative measures or anything day-to-day -day life that, uh, if someone is sleeping, sleep, uh, suffering, excuse me, from sleep paralysis, any other steps that they can take to make it stop? And and does that does the answer to that question differ if the person is a Christian or not? Well, for a person who's not a Christian, the best that I can offer them is to be able to, number one, stop the attack in its tracks. If so, if they are, um, but not be able to stop it for good from ever happening again. So they might be able to end in an individual experience. And the way that they would do that is by asking during an experience, e even if they can only think it or whatever, but praying to Jesus and asking him for help and asking him to help them with the situation. And what I've seen a lot of times is when people will do that, Jesus will help them. And that often leads to a uh, period of confusion for them to, uh, <laughs> why did this, you know, Jesus help me? Maybe there's something to this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, that's the limit of what they can do in terms of stopping the attack is praying to Jesus, asking him to help. The difference, of course, is that they're not commanding the demons to do anything. The demons aren't going to listen to them, but they can appeal to Jesus and ask him for help. And he often will help them during the during the attack. Um, but the attacks will come back because the doors are there and that person doesn't have ultimately the authority to do anything negative to the demons. So the demons don't really have too much to lose ultimately the the other thing that they can do is uh prevent the doors from getting worse they can't close the doors they can't do anything about what's already been done but they can stop doing the things particularly if they're doing you know something obvious some particular sin some particular uh whether it's occult stuff or or any other things in their in their life or drugs or what have you they can stop those doors from getting any worse but uh they're not going to to get better the, in terms of preventative maintenance for the Christian, they have a, a number of tools at their disposal. I would say uh, prayer before uh, bed is important. Prayer anytime is important. A consistent dialogue with the Lord about your life and particularly about sleep paralysis and closing the doors and things like that. If you sometimes they'll say if you only if you're experiencing sleep paralysis as a Christian and you know one of the you know, make, if you only pray about one thing every day, talk to the Lord about sleep paralysis and getting this thing figured out and, you know, asking him to help you close the doors. And, and it's some people will uh, say stuff about you need to renounce and repent and different things. Of course, repentance is important in a salvific, salvific sense, as well as, you know, uh, you know, just a, a daily sort of maintenance, I guess, or daily uh, repentance. But the point um, I, in terms of repenting from, as a Christian, past your past life, uh, some people make a big deal about that. You know, renouncing any occult ties or anything that you have done. That's that's a good thing to do. That's just uh, a good thing to do. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's like, you know, I think it's sort of included in salvation. Um, you right. know, I think that's a part of of salvation is that all that stuff is wiped clean. You are forgiven for it. Um, but it's, it never can hurt, but it's not, I'll say it doesn't seem to be contingent upon a renouncing of it, but others would probably disagree with me about that. Um, 
but yeah, that's there's a few other things I can't think of right now that I mentioned in the book in terms of preventative uh, measures that a person can take when they're a Christian. Of course, I would also say to a person who is a Christian who is experiencing extreme sleep paralysis on a regular basis, uh, they need to be... A Christian is a Christian, um, and you know... You need to be introspective. The, the Bible tells us to uh, to examine ourselves, to see if, in fact, Christ dwells in us. And it's a it's a good thing to be introspective and see, if, and, you know, if you really are saved. Jesus says you need to be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's re- he's referring to the process of of being uh, uh, of saved when the Holy Spirit begins to change your life and you start to see the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians five twenty two, twenty three, where you, where you start to see a changed life and some evidence that in fact you have been changed. And I'm not talking about you you no longer you know sin anymore or anything like that, of course. But I am saying that there should be some evidence that you're uh, uh, that you have been saved. If if the Holy Spirit of God truly dwells in you, then your life will begin to change because that's just God. I mean, if if God really does dwell in you, then you're not going to be the exact same person in every respect that you were before you said that prayer or whatever you did. Um, So I think a person needs to be uh, introspective about that. Um, I do have a chapter in the book and I put out a video uh, about that. How do I become a Christian and and go through a lot of those kinds of ideas? You know, how do you um, tell if you are a Christian and these these kinds of things? I I don't want to put any kind of burden. I certainly think that, uh, you know, it's not about, um, you know, uh, are you you know, to be too, too introspective about your life. And, you know, did you stumble today or fall yesterday or whatever? Those things are a part of the Christian life, but there needs to be some progress, uh, going as well. That doesn't mean that there can't be times of sort of, you know, backwards progress, but if you look at it in terms of an overall graph, that graph should be going up. And there very well could be people out there listening to the show who aren't who are not Christians and uh, are still suffering from sleep paralysis for, for non-Christians out there, could you explain how they can, uh, how they can come to know Jesus, why they should and how that can lead, you know, not only to an end to sleep paralysis, but also just a new and better life altogether. Well, sure. That's, um, that's what Jesus offers is not just a, you know, a better life in this world and an eternity in heaven, uh, but, but a changed heart. Uh, ultimately, all the religions are looking for that. If you, if you really analyzed every religion out there, they're trying to deal with two problems. One is that they know that they are, are not doing right by God. They know that God is there, and they know that they aren't doing what he wants. And there's this conflict going on between those two ideas and they want to ultimately reach a place where they can be kind of uh you know free not only from that burden but uh but but right with god and have a changed heart a changed that's what that's what essentially what the impossible task of of either hinduism or uh buddhism is trying to get to a place of nirvana or, or whatever where they're not so tied down by what they call tana which is basically desire and sin but that's what uh, Christ is offering, not just a forgiveness for all past transgressions, but also a freedom from the bonds of sin. You know, it doesn't have to, you don't have to be a slave to it anymore. He can take care of these uh, uh, desires. It says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So in addition to that, I think that the the reasons to turn to God are self-evident in the fact that he is God and he is, and we are not and we and he wants not just to have a relationship with us and those kinds of things, but uh, he wants to, uh, to in a real way, be our our father and really be in uh, involved in our lives. The main thing, I guess I would say, as opposed to a lot of the other kind of evangelism, is that I think that the key lies in a submission to him, um, a, a, a decision that you're not going, that you're not the king of your life anymore. And that you're going to be let him be the king of your life, whatever that looks like. If you and, and Jesus says a lot of stuff about that, where he says, basically, you if you're going to follow him, you got to count the cost. You have to 
you have to be willing to lay down all these things that have to happen in your life or and you have to be willing to just say even if everything doesn't go right even if i end up getting you know uh tortured to death tomorrow in prison camp i'll still follow christ and it's in that moment of sort of giving up your kingship and and letting him wear the crown that he oftentimes not just gives you this joy and peace that you've been looking for, but he oftentimes gives you the things that you wanted in the first place, but you need to first be okay with not having those things. Um, you know, the, the, the main thing, I guess, is to, and I guess that's what called, that's what repentance is, what people say you need to repent in order to be saved. Repentance is just a word that means uh, to change your mind. It comes from a Greek word, meta, noia, and that means to change your mind. And what you need to change your mind about is God. Instead of God, uh, essentially what you need to do is is stop being in rebellion towards God uh, and stop start being in submission to God. And one of the ways that God has uh, decreed for us to submit to him is through his son in being a disciple of Christ. The word disciple essentially means learner or follower. And I think it's good for people to identify with, with that idea and say, you know what, what are you? I'm not necessarily a Christian. I'm a, I'm a disciple. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a learner of Christ. And if you begin to seek him, then and he, uh, you know, God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That's pretty much how you're always going to find God. If you, if you really look for him. And the way that uh, Jesus has said, if you've seen, essentially, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is a picture of what God is like, what God's personality is like. And so as a a Christian, we need to learn from Christ, be a disciple of Christ. And, of course, we can do that through um, reading what the Bible has to say about him. So, you know, the book of John is always a great place to start. But, you know, finding some good... Uh, teaching out there, verse by verse teaching that's explaining the scripture um, is how I was uh, discipled uh, in addition to, of course, reading the Bible and so on and so forth. But you don't have to struggle so much with the the cool thing about being saved for real is that you really do know it and you know that something has changed and you have new desires. And that's where the desire to to be able to be free from the bonds of all the the sins that holds you back are, uh, is in the power uh, of God. You know, that's the thing that, that surprised me is that I had all these sins and stuff that were, that I was addicted to, but it was the power of God, um, that gave me the ability to do it. I, I know a lot of people say, oh, I couldn't have done it without God or whatever, but you won't really know how real that is until you're actually saved because he does give you the power to be free from it. That's part of the, of the deal. The whole cross basically is, you know, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. To make it really sh- simple, there was a, a, a trade on the cross. We gave, we, Jesus agreed to let us put all of our sins against God, past anything we've done in the past, anything we will do in the future. All that stuff needed to be punished in order for us to be right with God. And so he said, look, just give it to me and I'll take the punishment for you. And so on the cross, what happened is essentially the wrath of God was poured out on Christ on our behalf. He took the utter weight of the wrath of God that we deserved. And in exchange, he gives us uh, his righteousness. He lived a perfect and sinless life. And he just says that basically when we're saved, then he, you get, he takes our sin and he gives us his Righteousness. I kind of think of it like a, a cloak of righteousness. It says we're hidden in Christ. Basically, when you know that's our entire justification, not what we did right or wrong. On Judgment Day, when you stand before God, you won't say, "Well, I did this and I didn't do that, and I did do that." None of those arguments will work. The only thing that's going to get you uh, past those gates is you say, "I didn't do anything." But there was somebody that did, and he was totally righteous, and he deserved to go to heaven. And it's on his on his merit that I will get in here. He is the righteousness that I boast in, not my own righteousness. And so that's basically the gospel. Amen. 
Oh, I, I could not have said that better myself. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, well, I guess I, I, I have one more question, then we can uh, we can probably wrap up the show with that. Uh, you, you say in your book, too, that you've had a you've had a lot of uh, testimonies from success stories of people who have uh, implemented the things that you go through in the book. Uh, I, was, I was wondering if you could share some of those with us to kind of be an encouragement that there that there is hope and people have actually been able to stop. What, what are what are some of uh, some of the cases that, that stand out in your mind? Oh, uh, let's see here. Um... Well, on the website, there is a section that just says stories. If you go to stopsleepparalysis.org, there's a section that just has a lot of the written testimonies. And everything in the book, by the way, is for free. Um, you can listen to it all on an audio book available at the website, stopsleepparalysis.org. You can read uh, every – I posted basically everything in the book at, in an article form, in one form or another, on the website, including all the stories. Uh, but just from personal experience, I suppose there have been – uh, a number that stand out. One particular lady uh, was a – she was in a witch uh, coven at the time, and she was experiencing severe sleep paralysis where she was seeing these things, not just in sleep paralysis, but it gotten to the point where she was seeing them even in her waking state. And I suppose I should clarify and say sometimes, you know, on rare occasions, there's schizophrenia involved and things like that. Uh, and whenever those things happen, I tend to be very cautious about it and, of course, tell the person to make sure they're, you know, they go to a doctor and check it all out with them and whatnot. Um, but I don't think anything can can hurt for a person that even does have honest schizophrenia to, you know, if, you know, if they're a Christian, to rebuke it, you know, re- rebuke first, ask questions later. You know, what, what, could, what could it possibly hurt if a schizophrenic person right. was rebuking them? And we have seen success with that, too. Uh, but I would say I'm cautious to say that that's a, you know the cure for schizophrenia. I'm sure that there is a, you know a genuine medical condition there as well. But anyway, I don't think this lady had schizophrenia. But th- it does sometimes happen when a person has opened up severe doors that it gets out of the sleep paralysis realm and starts to uh, starts to affect their waking life. And she was being severely affected by this. When she first wrote me, this is kind of early on, I, uh, she was very antagonistic towards Christianity and stuff. And so I did uh, these audio responses where I just answer her, her questions and so on with, with audio files and send them back to her. And she, she said uh, later that she was really, really kind of upset about that because she knew if she pressed play, then I would be just some kind of, uh, you know, these like the Christians she knew in the past and real judgmental and all these things and <laughs> whatever. <laughs> anyway, so she she said like re- really quickly she she you know realized it wasn't like all those other Christians and so on that she uh, or people that claim to be Christians anyway that uh, she'd heard from the past. Anyway, long story short, we we had a, talked about a lot of her you know, issues with the Bible and things like that. And eventually got down to the issue of sleep paralysis and of course the need to become a Christian. Make a long story short, she did become a Christian. She is probably one of the most on fire, wonderfully saved Christians out there. I mean, she is a person who is, you know, you check her out on her Facebook page or whatever. She's just always, you know, completely just glowing love for the Lord. And she's a, uh, just has been so for, you know, several years now. And, uh, of course, the sleep paralysis and all the stuff is gone and she's just totally free from it. Um, but those are, I think, the ones that are most interesting to me, the people who came from the very most antagonistic towards Christianity and uh, and, and not just that, but involved heavily in the occult. But then when they become Christians, they become just these wonderful uh, on-fire Christians who just are uh, – who love the Lord. I think it is a, uh, a testament to what Jesus said about the woman who was uh, crying at his feet, wiping his her feet with her tears, and the the house of the 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 leaders there, and the leaders were saying, you know, do you know who this woman is? I mean, she's you know she's got a bad reputation, and Jesus kind of turns to his disciples and he tells them, a, uh, you know, basically asks them a question: Who do you think would be more happy to be forgiven, a person who owed you know a lot of money or a person who owed a little money? And I think it's Peter that says. Uh, it would be the person who owns a lot of money. And he basically says that, I tell you the truth, whoever is forgiven much loves much. And so it's often the people that have um, been forgiven much that indeed 
uh, show that to be true, then indeed love much as well. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> that, that's, that's really cool. Um, if people want to know more about you or your research, order your book, anything like that, where, where can they go? Uh, I think just the website, stopsleepparalysis.org. And uh, like I said, it's all for free there on the website. I tried to put a lot of the important information in video form as well as uh, most of it's in, in video form, but all of it is either in the free audio book, which you can see right there on the front of the page, and then also um, in the articles section. It's all posted there, including the testimonies, which you can get by uh, clicking the stories section at the top. You can contact me through there. You can sign up for the mailing list and uh, all that, and you can, of course, order the book there, too. Fantastic. Uh, was there any other area of this that you wanted to touch on that we that we haven't thus far? Or um, I don't suppose so. There's some, you know, there's a lot of different things that people experience, and I think sometimes people get hung up on the idea of what is the cause of sleep paralysis in their particular situation. I find that to be kind of a, a roadblock in some cases where you know we're trying to figure out what it was that's causing the sleep paralysis in my situation, and I try to just say. It doesn't really matter. If, if we never figure it out, it's no big deal. But it is, it is something that you need to know that, uh, that even in your case, it can definitely be stopped for good. If they've done the worst thing that, that's imaginable, um, you know, I, I've, I've seen people that feel like they can't, uh, you know, be saved because they sold their soul to the devil and all these other things. It doesn't, none of that matters. It doesn't matter what it is that you've done. You know, you can be saved and you can stop sleep paralysis for good in your life. You don't have to continue to experience it. Wow. Amen. That's that's awesome. Um, well, I, I want to thank you so much for being on the show, Chris. This is uh, this really has been extremely informative and uh, and enlightening, not only to me, but I'm sure to uh, the audience as well. Great. Well, it sure was a pleasure being on the show and I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to have you on again sometime. All right. Well, they, uh, yeah, again, thank you. And uh, let's see. Uh, that was Chris White, um, author of the book Sleep Paralysis, what it is and how to stop it. Uh, make sure to check that out as well as his other materials. He, he has a lot of great videos on YouTube. Um, every single one that I've personally seen, I could easily recommend. Uh, not a single one of them has left me unsatisfied or, or uninformed. There's always something uh, new to learn. So um, I cannot recommend his work enough uh, to the listeners. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to tell you about a new resource that's been made available. Um, I'm sure our regular listeners will remember a few weeks back our interview with S. Douglas Woodward about his book, Lying Wonders of the Red Planet. Uh, well, the interview that Doug and I did was actually around four hours long, and only a portion of that interview made it to air. So Doug and I have decided to release an MP3 disc of the full extended interview, along with several other resources, including free eBooks, rarely seen pictures of Mars, and much more. And I, I don't want it to seem like uh, that we just took the interesting stuff and put that on air, and then this is just leftover. Uh, it, it wasn't handled like that at all. It was pretty much just a time thing. We, uh, I had about two and a half to three hours available, so I just took the first two and a half or the three hours for the show. Uh, so the last hour to hour and a half or so is what is uh, on the extended interview that that's available now. And um, there, there's definitely some really interesting stuff on there. I mean, it, it, it almost broke my heart that I couldn't, I couldn't air it due to time constraints, but I, I couldn't be happier that we're able to uh, offer it now. So um, for more information on that, you can check out my website, www.ministudyministry.com, as well as Doug Woodward's website, which is uh, www.faith-happens.com. It's, uh, you don't spell out dash, it's actually a dash, <laughs> faith-happens.com. And uh, I'm also told that it will be available on Prophecy in the News in, in the near future. I, I believe to be paired with uh, Doug's book, uh, Lying Wonders of the Red Planet. Um, possibly by the time this episode airs. So uh, keep checking my website, Doug's website, or the Prophecy in the News website, website for that. And I'll keep, uh, I'll keep my website updated, and I'm sure Doug will keep his updated as well. 
Uh, if you would like any more information on materials Doug Woodward has available, you can check out his website. And uh, if you're interested in any other materials I have available, you can check mine out, which again is uh, ministry.com. I have all the books I've written on a wide variety of topics there, as well as free blogs, videos, every past episode of The Sharpening, other shows I've been on as the interviewee and much, much more. So keep checking back for updates. Uh, I'm also in the process of completing a new book, a full-length follow-up to Disclosure, that's all about recon reconciling uh, modern physics, such as the fourth spatial dimension, time, entropy, string theory, all that fun stuff, uh, with uh, the Bible. I'll keep posting updates on that as they come on my website as well as Facebook and, uh, and this show. Uh, all right, well, that is all the time we have for tonight. I want to thank you all for listening. And again, I want to thank Chris White for being on the show. As always, take care and God bless.